Good morning, Hope family. I know we are doing well this morning, amen? amen. And, and why is that? Because we serve an awesome God who is faithful, super faithful. All right, sorry about that. We good? All right. Well, look here, I don't want to take a lot of time. Can we pray? All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your love that you show us. Thank you, Father, for quieting our heart, Lord, when we're ripping and running and anxious to do so many things. Thank you, Father, for being patient with us. Thank you, Lord, for knowing our heart's desire and prov providing those things for us. Lord God, thank you for giving us comfort, Lord, when our minds and our spirits are unsettled. Thank you for that peace. You are an amazing God. And we come to say thank you. We come to exalt you because you are an amazing God. We know that there is none like you, Father. Father, you have the mighty hand and a powerful touch to change lives. So Father, we come for you to change us, cause us to be peculiar people for your kingdom. Lord God, don't allow us to leave here the same way that we came in. Work on our hearts. Help us, Father, to be like your son, Christ Jesus. Father, I ask right now that you would have your way. Remove the distractions, Lord, that are on our minds, Father. Father, cleanse us from any unrighteous thoughts. Lord God, cleanse us from the guilt of our sins that we've committed. Lord God, we repent right now. We turn away from all those things that keep us from you. And we put our eyes on you. Father, have your way. We pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so I had a, uh, a story that I shared the last time that I was up here, and I really feel moved to share that story again. Do you guys remember that story a little bit? It's okay if you said no. It's all right, because I want to share it again. <laughs> now, I know sometimes it's kind of unique because it could be what you want, and it may not be what the Lord wants. But it's so heavy on me that I believe that it's him. Because there's a part of my mind that says, well, they already heard it. They don't need to hear it again. But then I also got the scripture that says that Paul had no problem repeating what was true. Amen. All right? So I, I got this story. There's a man. He had a dream. And in this dream, he saw an angel come. And the angel escorted him to a Sunday service. And the man, when he got there, he saw the pianist. And the pianist was jamming on the piano. He was getting it in. And he also saw the praise singers singing. And he saw the congregation rocking with the praise singers and the pianist. But he noticed something. He said, I don't hear anything. So then the preacher, he gets up and he starts to move his lips. 
So the man, he looked at the angel and he said, can you explain this to me? And the angel said, yes. This is the way it sounds to us in heaven. He said that you hear nothing because there's nothing to hear. He said they have a form of worship. He says, but their thoughts, their mind is on other things. And he said their heart is far away from me. He said, this is the perspective of what God sees from heaven. Our worship of coming together, but yet it's really silent. So we're going through the motions. I'm going to be honest with you. It's hard to come in here with your mind focused on the Lord. There's so many distractions, so many distractions, but it was put there for a reason because I can, I can believe that the question is how bad do you want the Lord? How bad do you really want to be in his presence? Because he's going to put obstacles in our way and he, I'm meaning Satan, he's going to put those distractions in our way. Are we focused enough? to have our minds set on him. So today's title is how to avoid worship that is out of order. And I, I coupled this story with the idea of going to the vending machine. Because we recognize what out of order means. It means it doesn't work, right? We go to the vending machine and we see an item that we want and we put our money in it and we hit that button expecting to get something out of it and the screen says out of order, but it took my money. So I, I got a problem. So I understand that God should have a problem with us, the sacrifice that he made for us and then he doesn't really get the true worship that he deserves, right? So we're going to look at how to avoid worship that's out of order in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. If you guys could turn there, we're going to chop it up a little bit over what God says from Paul. Amen? Amen? Amen. Are we there? Yeah. All right, I'm not. Hold on. <laughs> All right. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 34. Now, when given these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. But first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be rec recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And we had, when he had given thanks, 
he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Section 1. In order to avoid worship that is out of order, mature believers must remember the reason why they need to come together. I was reading this story. I like these stories. These stories are very helpful in painting the picture. We need to remember why God gave us life. We need to remember why we do what we do. And if it's not centered around the Lord, then guess what? We're off track. <laughs> God gave us a purpose. God gave us instructions. Here it is. If this is not important to us in our life, then guess what? We're wasting his air. It's serious. We're in the midst of serious business. And we can't allow ourselves to get caught up in the flesh. Because we recognize that this is a spiritual battle. But if we don't recognize our purpose. And remember why we are here. Then guess what? The enemy can lead us astray. Right? I know that that's not on this sheet. But it's still true. In order to avoid worship that is out of order, mature believers must remember the reason why they need to come together. And the, come to, the coming together is out of a love for the Lord. Right? We come together because we love the Lord. We come together because we want to be in the presence of the Lord. That's why we gather together. Because we can sharpen one another when we come together. When we come together, we can hear the word of God to us. Not, oh, so-and-so should have been here to hear that. It's for us. It's for us individually to hear what God has for us so that we can live the life that God has called us to live. That's a part of worship. Is living the life that God has called us to live. To live to please him. Letter A. It is an opportunity to come together as one. Because we're going to understand that in this section, they weren't coming together as one. They were coming together, divided up. We knew earlier in scripture that they were saying that you know, there's a division in the congregation because I, I like Pastor Tanks more than I like Chris Mays. 
I, I, I like LaShawn more than I like Pastor Morris. That type of division. Yes. We're all servants of the Lord. Amen. We all speak the word of God. So it doesn't matter who's up. Right. Is the word of God being taught? Amen. Is the presence of his spirit yes. here? Yes. That's what's important. But it was division in that sense. And it was also division in the sense that the rich had and the poor had not. And they made it known. I praise God that we don't do that here at Hope Alliance. Amen. We are one body. So, it is an opportunity to come together as one and worship in the presence of God and fellowship among the body of Christ. Fellowship is another way of communing. It's a word that comes from community, coming together. Worship. What is worship? I mentioned it already, but I have it written down. Genuine worship is the honoring, loving, and surrendering of your lifestyle unto God in whom we live to please in everything. That's worship. You guys accept that? Worship is honoring God. Yes. Worship is surrendering to God. And it's not just once and for all. It's a continual Amen. surrender. Yes. Yes. It's a continual honoring. Yes. It's a continual reminder of what God has done for us. We know what God has done. And we can keep it moving. Right? Right? But it's better when we can have that reminder. The story that I was about to tell you about. A guy said, uh, he, he was a sports commentator, right? And it was during the time that it was all on radio, right? And he would set his alarm so that he could remind the listeners what the score was. Because he could get so carried away in what was going on with the game that he would forget. So he put an alarm in so that it would remind them of reminding everybody what the score was. Because that's what's really important. Who's winning, right? Well, I think that we should do the same thing when it comes to the Lord. That we have an alarm set that will remind us of what he has done for us, wow. who he is, and what he's going to do. We should have a reminder, why? Because it's easy for us to get distracted. It's easy for us to get our mind on other things. Yes. And it's good when you get that phone that ding, 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 ding. Like what is, oh yeah. Uh -huh. God, thank you. Thank you. It helps us keep our mind on him. Yes. Because if we don't have that, guess what? We got our mind on all of the evil. Right? We get wrapped up in what's going on in the world. Yes. The world is so messed up. What are we going to do? We need that reminder. Yes, sir. Yes. Huh, be of good cheer. Mm -hmm. I've overcome the world. Yes. Right? Yes. So a reminder. Remember what is our reason for coming together. It's about him. Mm -hmm. Right? And fellowship. So we come together to worship God. And we come together to fellowship among the body of Christ. And the fellowship is that brother-sister love. Right? That we come together and what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. Oh. <laughs> That's wrong. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And we're not doing it out of obligation. We're doing it out of the love that we have for each other, but ultimately the love that we have for the Lord. That make sense? This is demonstrated in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. I got it down here in your notes. 
Oh, the sheep. Let's read. And they continue steadfastly. That means unchanging and unmovable. In the apostles' doctrine, this is the teaching of Jesus that he shared with the people. Right? What was one of them? I got you. This is the one I'll never forget because because somebody said that to me and it rubbed me the wrong way. It says, a man who has his hand to the plow. Y'all familiar with that one? He said, if he look back, he is unfit for the kingdom. And it makes sense, right? If I'm showing my kids how to cut grass, right? And they cutting. Keep your eyes focused. Huh, Dad? You done made my yard look messed up, right? Because you took your eyes off of the focus. I want my line straight. I want it to look like artwork. I can't afford you to be looking back or looking somewhere else other than that line, right? So why would God be any different, right? Young man, he said, because I made the decision that I'm not growing here at this place. It's time for me to move on. He said, oh, so you're taking your hands off the plow, looking back. What? What is you talking about? I still love the Lord. It's just not here. I'm sorry, but he used that scripture to say, me leaving that church was me taking my hands off the plow or looking back. I'm like, all right, well, I'm glad I'm gone because you misused that scripture. <laughs> right? Wait a minute. But Jesus was saying to his disciples that if you allow distractions to get the best of you, then you are not fit for the kingdom. That fits us today. Amen. If we cannot determine and commit ourselves to focusing on the Lord, what good are we going to be? But it's going to be hard work. It's going to be, you know, where the scripture says that they needed to get to the bedrock. They had to dig. They had to dig deep. Dig, digging ain't cool. It's not cool at all. It's hard work. It hurts. You can get blisters. If you ain't got the right gloves, that can be hard work. But once you hit that rock, then it's over with. Now I can start building, right? We need to pursue God in that same, that same intensity. We need to keep our focus on him with that same intensity. Because if we don't, then the building won't be complete, it won't be secure, and then when the crazy times hit us, we'll fall away from the faith. We'll even say that Christ is not the Christ that we were taught. We can do that if we're not planning. Amen? Amen. I know it ain't on here, but we're going to get back to it. <laughs> It says that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking and the breaking of bread. And we understand the breaking of bread as being the Lord's Supper. And they continue steadfastly in prayers. Then fear or awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believe were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
I know that was a mouthful, but it says a lot. They met daily. Let's say we say we had church every day. Huh? Let's say we get together every day and have us a potluck. You know somebody gonna be like, why we gotta do that every day? Why we gotta come together every, every, every day? Won't we? We'll have that attitude. Why, why, why every day? Like we don't have a break? It's sad that most of us have this thought. We're saying that about our being in the presence of the Lord. We got to be in the presence of the Lord every day. Every day. <coughs> so that lets us know where our heart is. That's why our worship is out of order. Because we should have a passion. And I'm, I'm with you guys. It ain't like, I'm like, ha, ha, ha. I'm with y'all. Every day, Lord, grow my love for you so that I can have that every day. Because that's what we need. That's what we need right now. That's what we need right now. All right. It's a command. I don't think I have it on this side, but he says in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, let us consider, let, let us think about one another. Let, let us really be focused on each other in order to stir up love, that agape, agape love, that unconditional sacrificial love. Let us stir up that type of love and the good works that will come from it amongst each other. So not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. We know that in our workplace we share the gospel with people and as we're sharing they tell you, well, you know, I don't really go to church. I don't really, you know, do all that. Well, here's a scripture that says why you should, right? It's the building up of the body. It's the sharpening. It's the edification of the body. And if we don't have that, then we're losing out, right? I, I share something uh, with the inmates at the jail. I say church is like going to play football for an organization. If you don't ever go to practice, how are you going to play on the field? What coach in their right mind is going to put you on the field and you ain't even been to practice? Just because you got the ability. Just because you got the talent. It don't work like that. You need to spend time under that coaching, under that leadership, under that teaching in order to be equipped. You can't do it yourself. Amen. We learn that on our own. We can't do it. We need the fellowship. All right. I mean, what does scripture say? He says, Paul, in this scripture, said, I, I give you these instructions. And these instructions, this is not the first time that he's given these instructions. He already had told them about how to come together. And he remember, he got a report from Chloe that when they come together, it's all jacked up. It's not about Christ. He said, can Christ be divided? Then why are you? Amen. Right. So he gets this report. And he says, I can't even commend you on you getting together and fellowshipping and having your mind on the Lord. I can't commend you on that because you're not doing it. Amen. You're worried about self. You're worried about what you're going to do. We should, be, we should be coming here to worry about what the Lord is going to do. No? Yeah. When we wake up in the morning, that should be the thing that's on our mind. What is the Lord going to say to me to change me? What is the Lord needing me to do 
for his kingdom? What is the Lord wanting from me? Because I was here for a reason, and that reason is for him and not for self. We have to find a way to get our mind changed because we're looking at what people can do for us. We're looking for what God can do for us. Jesus told his, his, his disciples, he said, I know that you guys are coming to me because I just fed y'all. And y'all looking for some more. He said, but don't put your eyes on that. Put your eyes on me. Want me. Not what I can do for you. Want me. The prosperity gospels is what God can do for them. Not what they can do for God. He's not a genie. He's not somebody where we can, oh, Lord, I'll do this if you can. No. Lord, I'm not even worthy to call on your name, but because of the blood of Christ, I have the confidence to come before you and to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to live for you. What would you have me to do, Lord? Amen. Right? Amen. But we don't operate like that. Our walk is not serious enough to yearn for him. Now, when he snatched the bottom up from under our feet, that's a beautiful place to be. Because you ain't got nobody else to call on right. but him. Right. right? And it come automatically. Oh, my God! <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what happened. So let us get in the practice of just doing that all the time. Amen. No matter what the situation yes. is. Right? He says, to love on him. We need to love on the Lord like he loved on us. I had a moment, so I'm getting back on track. Section 2, <coughs> verses 23 to 26. For I received from you for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. We know the story. Mm -hmm. We know what happened to Jesus that night. Yeah, I just want to talk. The love that we're supposed to have for one another should be exemplified like Christ showed his love for his disciples. What do I mean by that? Jesus knew who Judas was. It didn't take him by surprise, right? Did Jesus, did, did God manifest it in the flesh, not kneel down and wash that man's feet, knowing that he was going to betray him? Did he not share in communion with that individual who he knew was plotting to betray him? How many, how many have been stabbed in the back by somebody close? Yep. You wash their feet? Huh? You invite them over and chop it up with them? Tell them the glories of God? Huh? No, nah, what we do? Uh, you hurt me? I'm done. That's it. Right? Is that the love that God showed us? Is that the love that he showed us? individually, huh? 
the times where we didn't know any better and we were saying that Jesus is not God or when we looked at certain situations, it was just like, how can God do something like that? And what did he do? He showed us, I love you. I love you. So what are we supposed to be doing? The same thing. In the way that he shows us, right? Because we can get on our own and do it wrong. Be obedient to what God says and how to love on them. But we know that we need to be that instrument because that's what God called us for, to love. And when he says that on the same night in which he was betrayed, he said, this is what I am going to do for you. I am going to sacrifice my body. I'm going to allow my body to be broken for you so that you can have eternal life. Do we have that inside us that we will give of ourselves so that one may be saved? Because that's the show. That's what he was doing. That's what he demonstrated to us. And it's but you know it's hard. You know it. <laughs> you know it's hard. The people look at you a certain way. You'd be like, oh, I know you need the Lord. But you just called me all these type of names that. Mm. Lord, I need your help. But I'm here. So I'm going to have to show the love of Christ. Sacrificial yes. love. Yes. Yes. That means to maneuver around those darts that's coming like, mm. but do you know how bad God desires you to be his? I understand that you think that it's this other way, that there isn't no God or whatever, but believe me, I wouldn't be here willing to die if it wasn't true behind what I'm sharing with you. We have to get to that point. It's not easy, but God says, if you follow me, I'll give you what you need to do the work that I've called you to do. Y'all believe that? In order to avoid worship that is out of order, section number two, believers must remember why they are to be thankful. Letter A. It is a command from Christ that we show thanksgiving. The Eucharist is another term for thanksgiving, a celebration, a thanksgiving for Christ's self-giving love and provisions for us. Letter one, I think number one. Remember the Passover and the cross. When Jesus instituted his supper, it was during the Passover meal. So we, we understand what the Passover is, right? We don't have to read that scripture. I like to talk about it, though. That's cool. Egypt oppressing Israel, right? God hears the prayers. And he goes through some plagues to get the Pharaoh's attention, right? And then Pharaoh, hardened heart, wouldn't listen, so he lost his firstborn, right? But before they made their exodus, God told them, I want you to take the blood of an unblemished lamb, and I want you to put it on a doorpost put it on the doorpost. I think it's wise to do what God tells you to do Amen. and not shortcut Amen. what he says. Amen. If he says be holy, be holy. Don't come up with no man-made reason about how to be holy in your eyes. Be holy 
like Christ is holy, set apart for God's word, and not share it with the world and this mess that's in here. Amen. Why? Because when, when the wrath of God comes, the blood of Christ needs to be on us. Amen. Needs to be on us, not beside us. Amen. On us. Because we know that that day is coming. And we need to be in Christ. We need to be of Christ. But we need to be in Christ. That's the only way that the kingdom of God will be seen here on earth. That makes sense? Yeah. And when they put the blood on the doorpost, the angel of death did come. And that's how Pharaoh lost his firstborn, is because he knew nothing about the true and living God. And he lost that battle, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to lose that battle. We want to do everything that the word of God tells us to do as far as our holiness, our sanctification, our godliness. We need to make certain that we are on that. Amen? Yeah. Amen. But under letter, under number one, Remember the Passover and the cross. I have uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 and 30. I'm going to read it to you. I just made that so that you guys can have it to read later. But it says, for the message of the cross, and the cross referring to the crucifixion of Christ, it's foolishness. Foolishness. Why is it foolishness to some? Because they cannot wrap their mind around the fact that God would allow himself to be hung on a cross as a criminal. <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's foolishness. What, what kind of God would allow himself to do that? But we know what kind of God. A God who loves us. Amen. A God who's willing to give his life so that we can have Amen. life. Yes. And life more abundant. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yes. Yes. Verse 30. But of him, of him, that God's plan, God's order, God's design, that we are in Christ. We are in Christ because of what God did for us and what he planned for way before we were ever thought of, ever born, God said, I want them to be in me, in my son, with me, in eternity. He already planned it. Are we not happy that we are part of his plan? Mm-hmm. Because he's patient, right? There's a scripture that says, seek him while he is near, right? While, while we have time. And, and, and that's something that circulates. That's, that's what I need to put on the phone, too. The little reminder. Do, 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 do. Seek him while he can be found. Seek him. Right? And I get laxed on what I know. I, I know that. If we do that, somebody's going to challenge us. What the Lord been talking to you about? Uh. <laughs> You gotta pull something from in the back. Mm. Uh, God is good. Yeah, okay. Come on. He wants us to be on him on a regular basis because he's gonna test us. He's gonna say, what has the Lord been talking to you about? And if we can't give him something fresh, seek him. That's, that's what he's been talking about, me seeking him. He's been talking to me about really seeking him and his righteousness. I, I've been looking at that. He's been talking to me about him being my shepherd. That's what he's been talking to me about, him being my. But again, you know, I'm, I'm going to step aside. Be like, now, Sean, tell them the real. All right, so. <laughs> it's good to do this when you have to preach. It's good to get it in, have that time. But God wants it when you don't have to preach. God wants it all the time. And that's what we have to get into the process 
in the habit of doing on a regular basis. Amen. That's real talk. <laughs> All right. It says, oh, I learned this too while I was studying. There was four cups that Jesus had went through in a Passover meal. Four cups. I didn't know. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that it was like more than one cup? It was four cups. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. That was in the beginning. It was before they even started the meal. It was a cup. It was a blessing. It's called Kaddish. K-I-D-D-U-S-H. So however that's pronounced. Kaddish, Kaddish, Kaddish. And it was a blessing over the cup of wine. And it was prayers that accompanied it. Then it was a second cup. And that cup was during the, I want to say abracadabra, but that's not that good. <laughs> the Haggadah. The Haggadah, right? And the Haggadah was when they went over the Exodus, the Passover. And they explain everything about what God did for Israel. And it was a cup for that. And that was the cup of plagues. Okay. And then the third cup is the cup where we see Jesus say, this cup represents my new covenant with you in my blood. But that cup was the cup of redemption. Do we learn? I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. And then the bread, he says, this is my body that is broken for you. That's personal. Mm -hmm. For you, for me. He broke his body for me, for you, so that we can have life. And what did he say? Do it. And we'll add this as often as you take of the bread. Remember me. I'm guilty of not doing that. As often as you eat, as often as you drink, in the presence of the body, remember him. And it seems like what we read earlier, that they met every day. They communed every day. And out of that, what happened? He said souls were saved. That's another issue that do we even care about souls being saved? I know we say we do. You know how many people we come in contact with? Are we motivated to have God save their life? Or do we allow that opportunity to pass? Even here, we take for granted even the people that's within our congregation. We ought to know that everybody here is saved. We ought to know that. And the only way that we're going to know that is that we establish life-on-life -life relationships with each other. Then we can know, or at least have the hope that they are. But there's situations where somebody passed away. You say, well, were they saved? I think they were. I think so. Haven't you done that? Amen. Right? Somebody passed away and you ask them, well, were they saved? And the person said, well, I, I think so. We should know so. Because God gave us that responsibility to be stewards over his people. That makes sense? I'm trying not to bore you, but it's true. Right? All right.
Let us see. It is not the life of our Lord or his teachings that will save us, but his death. Now, that wasn't my thought. That was one of Wearsby thought, but I understand what he was saying in that. Jesus was saying to his disciples and to the Pharisees, he said, you, you search the scriptures. He said, uh, but the scriptures point to me. And he said, you search the scriptures thinking that you can get saved from that or receive eternal life from that. He said, but the scriptures point to me. But yet you want to kill me. So we, we know that his, his, his life is awesome. His teachings is awesome. But if he did not die, mm -hmm. Amen. if there was no shedding of blood, there would be no redemption, no forgiveness of our sins. We wouldn't have it. We wouldn't have salvation if he did not sacrifice himself. But it's our faith in that. It's our faith that he died for us. It's our trust that that's what he did for a God who holds the universe in his hands. The universe. That he became man. 100% God, 100% man. And that he died for us. That's what he did. And he rose. But we know he lives in us through his spirit. What are we supposed to do? Go to him. Serve him. Love on him. All the way. Number two. Remember that he is coming back. He's coming back. John 14, 1 through 4. Because in verse 26, he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. God does not lie. Amen. He is coming back. Yes. Yes. And what condition will our hearts be when he returns? Will it be bent towards him? In John 14, 1 through 4, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. That's a strong statement for us. He will come back. Will we be ready? Hmm? And I gave you in, in letter B, Matthew 26, 29, just saying, about his return. All right. Now the hard part. In verse 27 and 34. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But going back into the idea that when Israel, I mean, not Israel, when the Corinthians came together uh, in, in, in how Paul is addressing the situation, they didn't have the Lord on their mind. All they were concerned about is themselves. They were, the rich were eating their food. Matter of fact, gluttonous towards their food so that when the poor were able to come, there was no food for them. And there was no type of remorse about, oh my goodness, what have we done? It was like, well, it sucks to be you. <laughs> the body of Christ is saying this. Well, you know, it's not my fault. You should have got here earlier. How is that love? Right, but 
There's some of us that can have those type of funky attitudes. Because somebody's going to come in and be like, where all the food at? If you was here on time, right? Because you got some people who are like real strict as far as when things are supposed to get started, not taking into consideration situations happen, right? Where's the love? Where's, where's the patience? Where, where's the understanding? Right? Well, Paul is dealing with them because that's how they were. He was like, well, you know, you weren't here. We ate it up, so, you know, pray to God. <laughs> I'm not saying that's exactly what, but we can have some attitudes like that. So, he says, examine yourself before you even come together. If you're hungry, eat at home. You got your own home. Do that at home, right? To us, if you want to fuss and bicker, do it at home. When you come here, it's about the Lord. That's hard. That is hard. But how serious is our worship to the Lord? That, that could be set aside. Because he can fix that. I can't fix it. Uh, me trying to be nice and all that other stuff. You know what? I'm, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray, Lord, help me stay focused on you. And remove the distractions in Christ Jesus' name. I need you, Lord. Before I come in here. Right? All right. All right. In order to avoid worship that is out of order, mature believers must examine the condition of their hearts towards God and towards one another. Letter A, self-examination is key to avoiding unnecessary discipline or unfortunate discipline from God and avoiding the mistreatment of fellow believers by unrighteous judgment, pride, selfishness, and Lack of self-control. How do we remedy that? And when we examine ourselves and we see the issues, confess them. And repent. Turn away from them and turn back to Christ. Refocus. So that we are not condemned with the world. Paul says that those who come together in an unworthy manner, they bring judgment upon themselves. He said, some are sick, some are weak, and some have fallen asleep. If it's because we come to God with an unworthy worship, unworthy manner, then we need to change that. We need to really be focused on the Lord. Amen? Amen. Therefore, Love one another as Christ has demonstrated his love for us. Let our love for one another be true and genuine. That others will not know that we, that others will know, I'm sorry, that we belong to Christ. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for refocusing our mind on you. Help us, Lord, to put into action the things that you have shown us today. Lord God, let us not be laxed in thinking that we're all right. Lord God, place in our heart a desire, unquenchable desire to seek after you. Lord God, to live the life that you've called us all to live. Lord, we turn away from the sins, Lord, that we have allowed to be in our life. We turn away from them right now and we turn to you, Lord, we ask, Father, for the filling of your Holy Spirit once uh, and for all, that we would be filled and that we would seek you to be filled each day of our life that you give us, Lord. And let us be a bright light in this dark world. Again, we thank you and we praise you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.